Welcome back to My Hot Kitchen, I'm Wendy, and you and I are cooking up a delicious romantic feast inspired by the flavors of France. For an appetizer, we'll be enjoying a rustic fig and mushroom galette, and the main course will feature a rack of lamb with a brandy reduction and roasted fingerling potatoes. Let's get the galette dough started first. So what you're gonna need is a cup of flour and one third cup of cornmeal, a quarter teaspoon of salt, and just for fun, a nice little handful of minced up chives. And the next thing that you want to do is whisk these all together, blending them, smoothing out any lumps, making them all one uniform dry consistency. Make sure you scrape down the sides of the bowl because sometimes the flour or the cornmeal will cling to it without your knowledge. And then once you've got a nice consistency reach, go ahead and add seven tablespoons of nice cold salted butter. Toss these in the flour to coat them, and then using your fingers, sort of break them up into the dry mix. Now a galette dough is a very simple pastry crust. It's a really easy one to make. It's actually very forgiving, really hard to mess up. And what you see me doing is using my fingers here to blend the butter and the flour together. The reason that I am choosing to use my fingers is because I feel like the heat from my hands warms up the butter just enough to blend it beautifully with the flour. And also, I know exactly how well mixed in my butter is, which is really important for the consistency of a good pastry. Sometimes rubbing it together in your hands helps to blend it further. And what you're looking for is lumps that are the size of peas to cornmeal, generally speaking. The galette dough is a fantastic pastry to master because it's very versatile. You can make sweet little tarts or you can make savory little tarts. This consistency looks great to me. So I'm just gonna work the crumbs off my fingers here as best I can. And then it's time to move on to the next step. So what you need is a third cup of ice water. And what that means is that you add a few ice cubes to a measuring cup, and then you measure up to the one third cup line. To that, you're gonna to wanna to add three tablespoons or so of sour cream, yogurt, or buttermilk. Tonight, I'm using sour cream. And you just wanna mix these two lovely ingredients together, keeping the ice cubes in it so that it stays very cold. Once you have them mostly mixed, you can add it to your dough. Just do it a tablespoon or so at a time, and then fold it in, being very gentle using a nice soft touch. Just want to make the dough cling together. You may or may not use all of your water yogurt mix. It's going to depend on factors in your own kitchen. Just going to have to go by touch on this one. Keeping the water and the yogurt cold, you will ensure that the butter stays separated out and the end result is a nice flaky pastry. That actually looks pretty good right there. I'm going to gather it together in a little ball here. That looks great. I'm going to stop adding any more water and yogurt. And then I'm going to set it up in the fridge. Because we just worked the flour so much, it's developed a bit of gluten to it, which makes it into a more chewy consistency. Not necessarily the texture we want in a pastry. So I'm gonna dip this in a little bit of flour to kind of help keep it from sticking. Just helps to prepare it for the fridge. Work it into a nice smooth ball, gently and lovingly patting it into shape. Then I'm just gonna put it in a bowl right here and set it in the fridge. It's gonna to need to chill in the fridge for about two hours. So this dish is an excellent candidate to do in the morning of the romantic feast or even the day ahead. It's time to pull the lovely galette dough out of the fridge. You wanna feel it being nice and firm and cold to the touch. Should release easily from the bowl because you put a little flour in it. And then spread out a nice little layer of flour on your, on your working surface here. Break it up into chunks about, about quarter-sized, well, 
quarter of the dough at a time to nice hand sized chunks and then compress them down into little balls and inspect them for evenness. It actually is important that they're all about the same size so that they bake at all about the same time. So I'm going to work these all into nice little balls and then we'll get to rolling them out. Alright, good. <clears throat> now I'm going to give myself a little space to work with here. A little bit more flour. I'm not feeling like that's enough. There is one thing I hate and that is when my pastry sticks to the counter. It just ruins everything. So start with plenty of flour. And then bring in your rolling pin. Probably want to flip it over so that you get to work with the floured side. You'll see it's quite sticky stuff. Roll it out into nice little rounds. The beauty of the galette is that it is a rustic tart, so it does not have to be perfect to be beautiful and delicious. Roll it out to about a quarter inch thick. So my rolling motion is kind of gentle and what I'm doing is letting the weight of the rolling pin do most of the work. And I'm working from the outside in, flipping it over as needed to make sure it's not sticking to my rolling pin or my work surface. Just want that nice controlled staying in place kind of thing going on. Excellent. Now on to the next step. Take a nice thin spatula and work that flour underneath the pastry. This will be your final touch before you start building the galettes. Just want to loosen them up from the counter so that when you go to bake them off they don't stick. No sticky pastries. Kind of adjust them out a little bit with your hands because you will have inevitably changed the shape just slightly by spatuling them up off the counter. Next step, we're going to take these figs and mushrooms here and we're going to toss them in just a touch of flour. And we are doing that because both of these ingredients have a lot of liquids in them. And if you don't add a thickener to them, you could end up with runny little galettes. But if you add just a touch of flour to them, the flour will cook in and thicken it up and nobody will ever know about your watery fruit and vegetables. Next step, brush these lovingly with olive oil. Really just work on the middle part of it. You don't want to work on the edges because that's going to make it harder for the pastry to stick to itself. This adds a nice base that will blend beautifully with the shallot and the garlic and really infuse the whole tart with its savory flavors. Sprinkling the inside with just a little touch of garlic. The garlic's pretty potent stuff, doesn't need much to work in this recipe. I have about a clove's worth here minced up. And then a little bit of shallot. Shallot's a beautiful cousin to the onion. It's very mild and sweet, yet pungent. It's really, really great for French cooking. Next part, stack the mushrooms and the figs. Probably take about two slices each. 
gravitate it towards the center. Mmm, these are going to be tasty. Yummy, pretty little tarts. Galette tarts, that is. And then sprinkle them with salt and pepper. This will help to bring out the flavors of the figs and the mushrooms. Also helps to expose the more savory side of the fig. And by the way, if you want, you can use dried figs for this recipe. Just give them a little bath in water for a few hours until they soften up and then slice them. And use them just like you see me using the fresh figs. The final step here. This is the really fun part. What you're gonna do is just sort of flop this crust up over the filling. Kind of pleating it as you go. It's going to want to do this naturally, so it's going to make this job very easy. Try to get this pretty tight up around your fillings for the best baked result. There you go. Yum. These are ready for the oven. So due to the rustic nature of this sort of tart, I am going to be using my baking stone. I've got my baking stone pre-warming in my oven that, by the way, I've set to 400 degrees. You want this nice and hot. And if you're gonna be using a baking stone like this, you'll also want it to be nice and hot. So I'm gonna use my spatula here and just scrape these bad boys up off the counter, right on there. That's fun, you can hear them sizzling. Puts a nice crust on it if you have a stone to cook with. A little bit more squeeze, loving squeezes. And then to finish them off, a couple little drops of balsamic vinegar inside each pocket. Adds that richness and fullness. There's no precise amount for this one. Just pour, really can't go wrong. The balsamic and the figs together are gonna sweeten up and rich up. It's going to be beautiful. I'm going to bake these for 20 to 25 minutes or until they've reached the color that I like. It's time to get these little beauties out of the oven. They smell so good. They're making me crazy. Oh, beautiful. They're very hot, so I'm gonna handle them very quickly and put them on little plates here. Pretty presentation. Mm -hmm. And you'll wanna let these cool for just a couple moments before you serve them to your sweetie. Wow, those look delicious. Aha, uh -huh. are you hungry? I am very hungry. Mm. Mm. Ooh. They're really, really hot. Should probably give them a couple minutes. <laughs> Woo! Mm. Mm. Well, those were delicious. It's probably a good thing I only made two each because I could have eaten at least a dozen of those. It's time to move on to the rest of dinner. So, like I said, we're going to be having roasted fingerling potatoes. So I have picked out five each of the most beautiful little golden potatoes that I can find, and I'm going to be roasting them whole. I am going to add about a tablespoon of melted butter to my pan here, and some yumminess to love them up with flavor. The simplicity of this dish is the elegance of the flavor. 
So we got about a clove of garlic and a little bit of minced up basil. And that's right, another little finger full of shallots. Give these a little loving toss here. Coat them entirely in the butter. The butter is gonna work on the skins and make them nice and crispy and golden and delicious. And then the final touch, again, keeping simplicity in mind, just a little salt and pepper. I'm telling you, just these few simple ingredients is gonna taste amazing. Another little toss here, and then into the oven. I maintained my oven temperature of 400 degrees. It's the same temperature we use for the galettes. And these little guys are gonna take anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. The potatoes have now had about a 20 minute head start, so it's the perfect time to get the lamb and these sauteed summer squashes going. I'm gonna start with the lamb. And what I'm going to do is begin by covering it in coarsely grated pepper. And I mean covering it. I'm gonna get it on there nice and thick. This is key to the flavor. Plus it adds a cool texture and, well, grinding pepper is always just fun. Use your hands to press it into the meat here and then flip it over. Repeat on the other side. Nice fatty side. This one's a lot easier to work with than the back side of the cut. Nice and thick. Oh, this is gonna taste so good. Beautiful, beautiful little lamb chops. Press it into the meat again. And then add oil to a saute pan. I'm using olive oil. Add a nice amount. I'm just gonna go give this a little wash off because I have cross-contaminated it with some lamb juice. There we are, all clean and ready to go. Meanwhile, let's get back to getting this lamb started. So I'm gonna take this beautiful rack of lamb and I'm gonna place it fat side down in my hot oil here. I'm gonna set it down in such a manner so that any splashing oil splashes away from me because it's hot. Give a little loving swirl here, coat it, keep it moving, and let it brown for about three to six minutes or until the color looks beautiful. This little beauty has been browning for several minutes now, so I'm gonna carefully give it a flip over here. I'm gonna pause for a few moments right here and really let it get the bottom of the roast. Oh wow, that looks really nice. What a glorious presentation this is. Right, go ahead and drop it down here. Let it keep on doing its thing for a bit longer. This bad boy is looking beautiful. I'm gonna go ahead and stick a thermometer in there. About halfway in. And what I'm looking for is an internal temperature of about 140 degrees. It's a sizzly little guy. Good, the thermometer is just at 140, so it's the perfect time to pull it. It's gonna continue to cook anyway because of the heat that's left in the bones. Now the next part is to go ahead and empty out almost all of this oil into a nice heat-proof container. You really don't need that anymore. Just reserve a little bit of it so that you can saute up your shallots. Give those a little love to pick up the flavors of the lamb beautifully. Just want to move them all around the pan here and sort of gather them into the middle. Then sprinkle on just about a teaspoon of flour. What we're going to do is make a little bit of roux. Add just a little bit more of that oil in there. There we go. Beautiful. Add just enough oil to soak up the flour. And what you want to do is take this to a very dark, dark brown color. So 
So with the sizzling and the popping of the lamb all done, it's a great time to go ahead and get the veggies started. So I have a nice pre-warm saute pan here to which I'm going to add olive oil, just a little bit. And then I'm going to toss in an entire crookneck squash and an entire zucchini squash. To those, I'm going to add a clove's worth of garlic, a nice big pinch of freshly minced basil, and another handful of shallots. I'm loving the shallots in this meal. Just give these guys a little toss here. A little salt and pepper to help them along. And they're just going to kind of do their own thing over here. Just toss them periodically as you're cooking them to ensure even cooking. A little salt and pepper to finish them off. In the meantime, I'm going to continue stirring my roux, looking for that nice dark brown color that I was talking about. We have a nice dark roux here with the shallots being heavily caramelized. They're pushing that burnt envelope, so they're going to have a really rich, full flavor. Next part is to add about an ounce of red wine and cook that off. This is for color and complexity of flavor. You can see how it thickens up when the flour hits it and as the water cooks out of the wine. Yummy! That's beautiful. And while that finishes cooking out, you can go ahead and add the lamb back into the pan. Just like that. There's going to be some drippings on the clean plate that you used. You're going to want to put those back into the sauce as well. Tons of flavor in there. Don't miss out on that. Then add a couple ounces of brandy. And then light it on fire. Woo! Now this fire is going to help sort of sear off the lamb and finish off the flavors. It's also going to concentrate the flavor of the brandy and the wine. It's going to be so good. Move that around a little bit. Wow, look at that. That is gorgeous. Now eventually the alcohol is going to burn out of the brandy and the fire is going to stop. That's the point when you know your sauce and your lamb are done. Yum. Well, the fire has burned out, so I'm going to go ahead and take this off the heat. Let it just sit over there for a moment while I finish off the zucchini and the squash. This need just a moment longer, so I'm going to go ahead and get the potatoes out of the oven. These little beauties are going to be so good. Love that the potatoes soaked up most all of the butter and just made the skins beautiful and wrinkly and crisp. The first thing I'm going to do is bring in the potatoes, place them right in the center of the plate. Hot! Next thing I'm going to do, stack the rack of lamb, cross potatoes interlacing the rib bones for the drama and presentation like I was talking about. Then, add the little squashes around it. Don't those look gorgeous? And then the sauce. Mmm. Doesn't that look good? Mmm. 
These babies are ready to go on the table. And that is how you turn your kitchen into the Corner French Bistro. Serve this up with a nice strong red wine like a Zinfandel or a Cabernet Sauvignon. Now call in your sweetie. Au revoir, apron. So thanks for joining me in my hot kitchen tonight. Have fun turning up the heat in your kitchen. And I'll see you next week. Night night.